So I'm joined today by a gentleman who has some really special stories from the old Vienna open mic. And I'm going to let you maybe just start with that, Mr. Aureli. How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, my, I have the distinction, uh, I believe, as being the final performer at the final old Vienna coffee house open mic. Uh, in what year was this? That would have been 96. Yeah. Okay. That was and me. It was probably a day or two after Christmas. If it might have been the day after Christmas, if I remember. Okay. Yep. That that uh, I don't have any recollection of what time of year it was, or even what song or two I would have played. But I do remember what was said to me right before I went on, uh, which is it's not normal. Normally, I would remember like the music and the interaction with the audience, but all I remember was you sir uh as i went on stage saying please don't suck <laughs> i believe that's a direct quote or 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 thereabouts i'm awful sorry about that but you know what it's a great little thing that we both remember absolutely yeah and uh and you know i mean i understand the the sentiment too i mean of course you're it was the end of, of an era and um you know in the big scheme of things maybe it's not the most flashy or high powered, you know, uh, era in as far as the entertainment industry goes, but as far as a scene and a region and a community, it was a very important thing. And you don't want to go out on a sour note. <laughs> Tell me how you found the old Vienna and, and um, how you structured some friendships that you've made long term as a result. Yeah, I mean, the old Vienna, it's funny, it was a little bit before my time as a performer. Uh, I didn't really start getting out there performing in earnest until about 96, which was the year I graduated in, uh, from college. Um, but uh, the old Vienna was this kind of mythic thing just beyond 495. You know, I grew up in, in a suburb of Boston, so everything you know, west of 495, it was like, there be the dragons, you know, I'd, I'd heard about this, this, uh, you know, community out in, in Western Mass, Northampton had a scene of its own and had, you know, the Iron Horse was another kind of famous venue. And the Old Vienna Coffee House was one of these regional venues like the, um, the Left Bank Cafe up in Blue Hill, Maine, or um, Del Rossi's Trattoria uh, up in Dublin, New Hampshire that were part of this traveling songwriter circus. And I actually don't have a lot of it, a personal experience going to a lot of those venues because I think mainly I was either too young, I was still in high school, um, and I didn't really have to go because there were plenty of church coffee houses and, and venues in the Boston area that I could you know more easily get to. Um, so I only went to the old Vienna, I believe a couple of times or a few times all for the open mic. Um, I don't think I ever, I don't recall ever seeing a show there, but uh, I would go to the open mic and it was one of those things where you would just wait literally all night long because you wanted to be part of that, a small part of that community that badly. That's how important it was to um, the general folk scene and to your development and evolution as an artist. Your evolution of as an artist has been one of my favorite stories to watch from afar. I wish we were closer and I could hear more and share more of it. But your songwriting is as poignant as anybody's that I've known anywhere. And you write songs that matter. You write songs that get to the heart of a matter. You write songs that have a universality. You, you, you are just... Um, wonderful in that. And one of my favorite songs, of course, is the song By Degrees. And I only recently watched the video. I've always listened to it on the album. And can you share how that came together? Because you got some players on there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, the By Degrees project was really, it was really a, a kind of a Hail Mary sort of thing. I I wrote the song uh, on an airplane um, on my way to North Carolina for a gig with Paula Cole. And I was watching um, my Twitter feed, seeing uh, the responses to um, a shooting uh, out in uh, Oregon at a community college. Um, 
And I remember just, I'd stumbled upon the hashtags associated with uh, the, the postings. And that meant that I was out of my little algorithmic bubble. And I was starting to see both, you know, left wing and right wing kind of posts and was just kind of shocked at, at uh, the, the kind of duality of the discourse, uh, if you can call it that. So the song kind of tumbled out of me very quickly and I recorded it. Um, I think when I got home, I recorded it down here in my basement and um, wanted to put it out immediately and actually pushed it out to a few radio stations where I could email people um, directly. And some of them played it. WUMB here in Boston uh, added it to their uh, their their uh, programming, which you know, to their credit, because anytime you're you're singing about something like that, it's a, a political song, and if you're a nonprofit or a, a university affiliated radio station, that can be problematic. But um, you know, people in my little community knew about it, and it kind of went away pretty quickly and i thought like the song is just it's that's it's supposed to do more it's not done and uh one night i remember i was in uh the canadian rockies of all places playing with josh ritter and his band and um another shooting happened somewhere and uh and i thought i gotta put this song out again but i need other voices to to get it over and to get it out you know with further reach than I can do on my own. And I had connected with Roseanne Cash through Twitter, actually, um, improbably. I tweeted at her about the song and she wrote back to me, you know, DM'd me and we became friendly through the song. She actually invited me to um, play it with her with her at a, um, a Brady campaign uh, benefit uh, fundraiser. And I said, if I was going to record a proper version of this song, it's got to include Roseanne. So let me run this by her. And if she says yes, then I have to do it. And if she says no, it's dead in the water. And so I, I texted her, you know, right before I went on stage. And uh, by the time I came off, there was a response saying I'm in. And so I knew I had to do it. And from, you know, from then on, it was just a, a matter of cajoling people to take part in something, which, you know, turns out is pretty challenging if you're not like a huge international star <laughs> <laughs> well it's an important song and it still has legs it still has life and unfortunately there's too many circumstances that bring it back to life too regularly so yeah you know that song has actually an indirect roots in in the old Vienna coffee house community in that uh one of the times that i was there for the open mic uh katie curtis was there um at the time, you know, this would have been the mid 90s, Katie Curtis was, I mean, her star was either fully risen or definitely on the rise. I mean, she was recording records with people from the E Street Band and um, she was a big, uh, I was a big fan and um, I maybe opened for her once or twice and was friendly with her. But um, I think I played a song at the open mic and I didn't even realize she was there. And she jumped up from the audience and came and found me and said, I love that song and, you know, we should, we should get together sometime and write. And so we ended up, uh, first, I think we just got together to share each other's uh, new songs with each other. And um, that kind of evolved into a co-writing relationship. And both of us were kind of um, on a tear with kind of socially in, uh, inspired music at the time. And we wrote a song called um, People Look Around, which won the International Songwriting Competition Grand Prize. And uh, we wrote a song called Passing Through together. We wrote another one called Here and Now. These kind of socially inspired uh, kind of folky sort of anthems. And that kind of all got me, that all primed the pump for what became By Degrees. So, you know, I think if if I'm honest about it, uh, By Degrees, you know, owes a, a, a tiny debt to that that old man at Coffee House uh, community as well. That's, um, yeah, that's um. That community also led to somebody who you spent a lot of time on stage with. You know who I'm referring to, but for folks who might not, you want to share some of that? Yeah, I mean, I know Lori McKenna um, had uh, an even more uh, frequency at that venue and on that stage than I did. Um, I don't believe we ever crossed paths there. I think our our history starts kind of closer to Club Passim. But, um, you know, it was really... Uh, 
I don't want to say the same community because that kind of diminishes uh, uh, things, but it's it was an, a heavily overlapping community. Let's put it that heavy. Way. It was a magic time in the region that was yeah. short lived, but man, rich. Yeah, and uh, you know, I'm I feel very fortunate to have come up at the the kind of tail end of that time where. Uh, singer songwriters you know just a, a guy or a girl with a guitar could go out and just really achieve quite quite astonishing by today's uh, standards success um, on a on a real large scale you know I, when I was going to the Newport Folk Festival back in the 90s you wouldn't think anything for Greg Brown to walk on stage uh, with just a guitar solo sit down and then play a 45 minute set and the whole thing whole place would be wrapped you know mm. and that that would happen with patty larkin and any you know any number of people um as the scene kind of got uh more and more commercially ascendant i think you know the the introduction of the singer songwriter with the band uh backing band you know became a little more of a thing and uh you know that had its own uh, people had their feel strong feelings about that but for a while it was just you know one person with a guitar uh and that was really the expectation and that was really what audiences seemed to want and those venues like the old vienna coffee house were just tailor-made kind of perfect environments for uh you know the kind of deliverance of a song in in, in that way and in that format Man, I'm just reading some of the titles and songs that you're writing, and I talk about song poignancy and, you know, the song Blindsided, <laughs> Let Your Darkness Down. I yeah. Mean, you know, man, I, I'm, how's that going for you? Uh, it's okay. You know, yeah. I mean, it's that there's times when uh, I could almost convince myself, like, oh, this isn't really happening. Um, and then uh, I'll go into a, you know, a dark room or I'll uh, drive down a, a tree lined street, you know, and uh, go in and out of the shadows. And they're like, oh, no, this is this is definitely happening. Um, you know, a lot. some of those songs, some of the recent songs that reference sight and uh, vision and even the, even light and darkness, a lot of those actually predate my knowing uh, that I, I, really? I had this condition. Um, maybe there's some part of me deep down inside that knew, uh, I mean, that entire blindsided record came out, uh, six months before I was diagnosed and I had, I had absolutely no idea. In fact, I was kind of using blindsided as a, you know, kind of flipping the metaphor and using it as like a positive, like blindsided by, by love, you know, in a good way, um, as opposed to the pejorative way that, you know, you'd see it, you know, more commonly used. And, you know, in that first line of uh, by degrees, you know, when I take a look around me, sometimes I wish I was blind. I mean, that that's not a line I would write now. Yeah. But um, but at the time I didn't know. And um, and I thought about, like, do I change that um, or not? And I think I think kind of my where I've come down on all this stuff is that, like, I just am most interested in doing the emotional work and the the heavy lifting that gets me to a point where I can sing this stuff and it doesn't it doesn't bum me out or or it doesn't um or it doesn't get translated in such in in such a way to the audience you know right. and uh and I I'm I'm pretty much there with that every once in a while I'll I'll sing that line from from by degrees and go you know <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> you know? you know, it's funny because if you take the, the story subject out of the song by degrees and what you're singing about there, and you drop in this topic that we're discussing, sure, they meet somewhere in the middle. And if you've got a song, don't let anybody, even yourself, talk you out of it unless you really think there's a there's a reason to do it. Because you never know, you never know who you're gonna touch. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I feel that that's actually one of my songwriting uh, and performance yardsticks for, for myself now. Um, if I get to a point where I feel like I'm singing something that feels very raw and very vulnerable and very emotional, 
um, that to me is not the time to pull back. That's that's an indication that I'm saying something that could help others, like you say, you know, and that is imp it's important to share that. And, you know, social media is this kind of parade of everybody's, you know, seemingly best moments and their successes. And and I think we're all a bit unhinged by this constant exposure to that. And what really kind of brings us together and ironically lifts us up is hearing about people's challenges and hearing that other people struggle and, you know, deal with their own version of, you know, whatever that looks like for them. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm fully with you. The, the only thing that I really pull back from uh, is when I feel like I might be potentially speaking for someone that doesn't have a chance to speak for themselves, you know, like, so I, I'd be very hesitant to talk about, you know, my kids or my wife in a certain way in song because they don't have, they don't really have a chance to respond and it doesn't, it doesn't feel fair. But as far as my own interior life goes, um, it, it's, it feels pretty much all, all valid and the scarier and more vulnerable and more open it feels probably the more important it is to, to say it. You're in a wonderful place and a scary place at times where you get to stick by your convictions. Yeah, I mean, I, I it's interesting. The politic, the quote unquote political songwriting or political art stuff. I've really kind of gone around and around on that. Um, I mean, I have my my political convictions and I, I don't think those are too hard to surmise from, from yeah. anyone that's listening to my yeah. art. Um, you know, at the same time, I want, I do want the widest audience possible so that I'm talking across however many lines I can, I can talk across and sing across because I do feel like we are not as you, yes, we're all special and we're all unique, but we're actually not as unique and special as we probably think we are. We have a lot in common and there is a lot of shared life experiences to address through art that, um, you know, quote unquote, political stuff can kind of prevent you know, I'm not afraid of of taking a stance in a song, but I would say that even even a song like By Degrees, um, I think of it as a love song. I'm not writing that song because I think that I can affect, you know, gun gun violence legislation or I can, you know, more quickly or effectively bring about, you know, gun control or, or whatever. That's not why I'm writing that song. I'm writing that song because something I love feels like it's suspended in the balance. And it's, I'm not just talking about my kids every time I send them to school. I'm talking about um, my sense of hope, my sense of faith in my fellow human beings that we can decide that we've had enough of something and that we can change something for the better. And so that's, you know, to me, that's what I'm writing about every time. I don't, I don't think art can really be sustained uh, very long through uh, anger or hate um, or frustration or all those things that I have certainly felt looking at political situations and feel. Um, but the one thing that are, that will power art forever and will outlast everything is love. And so that's, that's where I try and um, write from a place of, of love. And you know, if you hear me singing about something that I feel seem to be expressing deep convictions of, I love that what's at stake very much. And, you know, if someone disagrees on <laughs> what I love, they can they can write their own love song and it's and we can have both of them. <laughs> hey, everybody, I'm Mark Arelli. And in case you hadn't heard, the old Vienna Coffeehouse community is doing something really special. They're getting the band back together for uh, a reunion, and you can be a part of helping make that happen. Please uh, donate at the link below. You can learn to live with anything when it happens by degree.